Bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenu. Welcome to this fifth edition of the World YWCA Young Women Leaders Panel Series. We are very thrilled to have all of you joining us today to hear more about young women transforming systems for gender equality and social justice, particularly as we continue to navigate with the COVID-19 pandemic. This panel is in collaboration with the Office of the United Nations General Secretary Envoy on Youth. And today we will be hearing more from the life experiences and context of our amazing panelists and leaders in Haiti, Honduras, Palestine, the United States, and from our moderator and youth champion from Sri Lanka. Um, just to uh, start, um, speakers will be sharing more on how they thrive to transform systems that are based on patriarchal, oppressive, and colonial ideologies. And we would like to encourage you to also, wherever you are listening to this panel, um, to reflect on the barriers that you encounter in your own communities and that prevent the achievement of uh, equality and uh, justice. My name is Daniela Celaya Raudales. I work at the World Wide WCA as Young Women Engagement and Mobilization Specialist. And before we start, um, allow me to share with you uh, a few housekeeping announcements to consider as we carry on with our panel. First of all, Please note that this panel will be conducted both in English and Spanish, and interpretation will be available throughout the event. Whenever you need interpretation, please click on the language uh, you would like to hear on the interpretation icon on the bottom of your screen. If you are on your phone, normally this option should appear when you click on more. Most of the panel will be in English, so if you understand English, leave your interpretation off and only change it whenever you need interpretation from Spanish. So basically, if you hear Spanish, you need to hear it and you need to hear it in English, click English in the interpretation function. Para la interpretación de inglés a español, simplemente hacen clic en el... Interpreting of English uh, to Spanish, you need the... Uh, you just click on the bottom part of your screen and you select Spanish to be able to listen the conversation either both English and Spanish um, there is no need to, uh, and you don't need interpretation then you just leave the function off um, kindly note that the panel is meant to to be for for an hour and uh, we have enabled the chat box for participants to share their greetings or from which part of the world world that you're connecting from uh, but we are also enabling the chat box in case you have any uh, technical uh, difficulty and need any assistance, you can send a message to Worldwide WCA and we will do our best to assist you. Um, please note that the chat box will be used for, for greetings and for um, whenever you need technical assistance. Uh, please do not use it for questions as we have a separate uh, function for questions and answers that will be used after the discussion. Last but not least, uh, please note that this panel is being recorded and it will be transmitted in World Wide WCA Facebook page. Uh, before I introduce our moderator for today, I would like to give the floor to World Wide WCA General Secretary Casey Harden, who has a welcome message for us. Casey, over to you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, bien, bien, bienvenidos, bien, bien, uh, bienvenidas. Welcome. Welcome. I, uh, this panel is one of a series that World YWCA has put on because um, we get the pleasure of working with um, young leaders all around the world every day. But particularly, and even especially after we've all moved to this remote world um, over this past year, there was just a glaring uh, absence of young leaders who were contributing, um, particularly in the spring and early summer, contributing to really important conversations um, about social justice and equality and the COVID response and so on. So we committed to a series of panels to create space, not to just have one or two young leaders on a panel or just one, but to actually 
um, have that be the entire premise of, of where we wanted to invest and put our efforts and uh, support leaders around the world. So, uh, so welcome and thank you for being part of this series that we've been doing. In the last 24 hours, as I thought about what I wanted to say and welcome, in the last 24 hours, I've had the pleasure of speaking to one-on-one uh, -on -one with young women leaders across three different continents. Um, one of the leaders uh, is working from home in her engineering job, but she has a vision of creating a, um, a fair, ethical clothing line um, in India. So she is using this time during COVID actually to do an internship because in some ways she has freedom she wouldn't have otherwise. And as she's pursued that, intern the, that internship, she's been going to other uh, companies and manufacturing plants and found that there was an absence of masks and sanitary um, uh, or PPE and, and sanitizer. So as part of her internship, of course, she responded, she saw a need and she's bringing those things into um, the manufacturing houses where she's doing this internship. I talked to another young woman uh, yesterday and she's in Africa and she's not in her home country in Africa. She's actually in another country because she has the support of the African Union to work on translation skills. So she can bring her wisdom and her leadership to multiple multilingual uh, places. What that means for her in COVID is that she's not with her two-year-old daughter. She is months into only FaceTiming with her two-year-old daughter once, at least once a day. And she knows that she won't see her daughter until December sometime. So she's doing this really intensive schooling, but she's also being responsive. She is actually uh, coordinated and is leading virtual spaces, um, in some cases safe spaces for young women um, across the continent of Africa in order to not be isolated during lockdown. And then the last example is a young woman in the United States who within the last week has participated in her small town in a Black Lives Matter event. Um, secondly, she's been doing postcard campaigning, meaning she's sending postcards in important states in the United States to ensure that people vote in order to have a democratic outcome. Um, and lastly, she's participated in her ecumenical community to really bring information to the community. So I say all that, my real point here is that we say young leaders, we say young women leaders, and I want to name that young leaders are not homogenous. Each leader brings their unique skills, their unique uh, point of reference, and their unique reality. The one, there are commonalities, though, that I think that exist, and that's resilience, creativity, innovation, adaptability, and boldness. And sometimes exactly what's needed, which is unapologetic boldness. So I'm naming that before the panel today. I'm so excited, um, uh, Yayama, as we said when, before we got on here, so excited to have you moderating. You truly walk the talk as the UN, UN Envoy for Youth, and I wanna celebrate that and really name that in this space, and you do it boldly and oftentimes unapologetically. And I also want to thank um, Selena, Leticia, Gabriella, and Alicia for participating. And I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say today. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Casey. We deeply appreciate your words, um, the stories that you shared, and your support and leadership um, toward the realization of uh, women and young women's rights across the world. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator to for today, uh, Yayatma Wikramanayake, who not only is the youngest senior official of the in United Nations, but also the very first young woman to be appointed as United Nations Secretary General Envoy on Youth. Originally from Sri Lanka, she has worked extensively on youth development and participation and has played a key role transforming the youth development sector in her country. Yayatma, thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for, to your team as well. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Danny. And uh, what a great 
uh, setting that Casey did to kick off our discussions today with those stories and the qualities that she highlighted from the young leaders that she has met and worked with. I think we can see a lot of resemblance in our speakers of the panel today. And I'm so excited to host this, co-host this panel together with World YWCA on young women transforming systems for gender equality and social justice. Just yesterday here at the United Nations headquarters, the government celebrated 75 years of the United Nations. And um, looking back at how the UN came into being and seeing how um, it was um, a handful of men in suits in a room that actually formulated this international organization. For us to be here today, 75 years later, with a group of young women from the Global South talking about the issues and strategizing and networking to find solutions truly feels so empowering. And I really think that the leaders of today are really the leaders who are going to bring about the transformational change that we've been looking for in the past 75 years. And talking about the United Nations and global uh, cooperation and by extension globalization, we all know that the unfair globalization has led richer people to get rich people to get richer and poorer and marginalized communities to suffer from the consequences of unfair globalization so while it's while the benefits of that globalization have sort of been concentrated only in certain communities, only in certain population, we see that the communities who are most affected by conflict, by humanitarian crises, by natural disasters, and by oppressive regimes in many parts of the world, um, really being exposed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. These inequalities, these issues existed before the pandemic, but the pandemic has exposed them, but also exacerbated them. We all know that these age-old patriarchal and conservative norms and practices battered together with conflicts and global challenges like COVID-19 further control women's access to resources, their right to freedom of expression, perpetuating racial and judicial prejudice and poverty. But globally, we have seen since uh, past couple of years, how young people are taking to the streets, running for office, organizing, protesting, demanding for substantive action and, and transformational action in areas from gender equality to racial justice against gun violence and fair globalization. We've seen this from Peru to Lebanon to Iraq um, to what's going on right now in places like Belarus and Poland. Young women have been in the forefront of these um, demonstrations that we see, these social justice movements. And I'm so honored to share today's panel with four such incredible young women leaders from YWCA community. Let me introduce to you Selena Salame from Palestine, Gabriela Miranda from Honduras, Elisha Rhodes from the United States, and Leticia de Graf Sharp from Haiti. I want to ask our speakers to introduce themselves to all our audiences today. Selena, first over to you. Well, thank you, Yam Yamatma. Uh, my name is Selena Salama from YWCA of Palestine. Uh, I am the founder of Selinche Jewelry and a project coordinated at the Y for almost six, six years. Uh, my work focused primarily on mobilizing youth and supporting them to claim and advocate for youth rights using international tools such as uh, UNSCR 2250 and 1325. And um, my activism actually, um, I don't know, do you want me to talk about how I started my activism? Tell us a little bit. You, uh, you seem to wear many hats from a young entrepreneur to a <laughs> social justice activist. So tell us a little bit more about your work. Uh, well, I started my, acti my activism um, ever since I felt that uh, uh, ever since I, I was living in Palestine and living under so many obstacles and challenges and like uh, so little so little opportunities. Uh, so I thought it's 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 hell to live here. But then it occurred to me that why not why not I be the change that I want to see in this world and just start the journey from there. 
thank you very much for sharing your story, Selena. Gabriella, over to you. Let's see if Gabriella is here. She was experiencing some technical challenges. So I think she's unable to speak right now. Let's try to get her back on the panel, but let me move to Elisha. Elisha, please introduce yourself. Hi, Alicia. Oh, I think you're hi. muted. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was toggling between the Spanish and English translation. Um, so thank you so much for, for having me, Royal YWCA, um, and also thank you to our gracious moderator. Um, my name is Alicia Rose. I am the Vice President at the YWCA USA of Operations and Finance. Um, I came to this work um, as a young activist. Um, I grew up in inner city Brooklyn where uh, people that look like me, uh, we represented most of Brooklyn, but we did not have opportunities. Um, and as I journeyed through college, I often found that I was the only one that uh, had my skin shade um, in rooms um, or the only woman in some rooms. Uh, so I wanted to uh, take my skills and my passion to an organization that uh, was dedicated to making sure that folks that look like me was not, we weren't the exception, um, but we were actually the rule um, and that we deserved a seat at the table. So I joined the YWCA and I've been fortunate enough to just be part of a movement that dedicated resources and continue to dedicate resources to the advancement of not only um, people of color and most marginalized communities, but uh, to young women. Um, I have been fortunate enough, as I said, to work with amazing people. Um, we have done some amazing things and made some, some great strides um, in the US as it relates to young women's leadership. Um, but I have made a conscious decision to dedicate all of my resources um, as I am aging out of young women um, or have already aged out to make sure that I have le left a space for other young women to follow and not one space, but many spaces. Um, so you will often find me um, speaking up um, for young women's rights and, and their ability to lead, um, whether I am in the back coordinating spaces um, or um, on the front lines. Um, I am passionate and I believe that if we are to move forward, we have to do that with young women at the front. I agree 100%. Thank you so much, Alicia, for those opening reflections. Um, Leticia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Leticia. I've um, been working with the YWCA Haiti for the past um, almost three years, yes. And I started working with women when I was doing my bachelor degree in Dominican Republic. And I was, uh, as a psychologist, um, offering my services in um, psychosocial support to um, survivors of domestic violence in, in Dominican Republic. And I started getting more and more interested in getting to know um, my community and identifying what in our behavior and relationship um, um, promote violence to um, address this, uh, these um, difficulties at the root. So when I moved back to um, Haiti, I met with my predecessor, um, Pierre Antoine, who talked to me about the movement, the YWCA movement. And she offered me the opportunity to volunteer with the YWCA Haiti. And right then and there, I realized that that was my calling to start working with the youngest girls. And they're um, starting to um, deconstruct these um, system, thought systems, these stereotypes that promote violence among our communities. So um, it is with my work with the young girls that I started um, doing some uh, activism work and promoting leadership among the young, younger girls. And like, 
our motto stay stay in um, the wider we speak world uh, Haiti changement c'est avant de commencer the the change starts with me we promote the the leadership young very young starting young with the the starting with girls five years old to 18 years old and older um letting them know that they have a voice in their community in their family and they can make big changes starting to educate themselves and educate their family and then their community so that's the work i'm doing with the wide OECA. i'm also a psychologist i specialize in um, sexual education and I also work with couples and also um, dabbling in the interaction and challenges that can um, arise from couple therapy and between women and, and men. So I feel like my work in the wider WCA completes the the work that i do with 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 couples intervening like i said and the at the youngest age and tackling the those thoughts and stereotypes that promote violence that's fantastic um we would love to learn more about your work and i'm going to come back to you with specific questions leticia and i think from what all of you have shared today um there's a lot to learn from i often get the question from young people when i talk to them you know i work in a bank i work in a private sector company how can i be active in social justice issues and i think all of you are really great examples of um, wearing multiple hats and really using your voice in your sector and in your community communities to bring out the needs and the rights um, of young women and girls um, in your communities. Thank you so much for your work. Um, let me go back to Gabriela. Gabriela, welcome. Please do introduce yourself. Hola, buenos dias. Hi, good morning. Can you listen to me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. Well, I'm a young member of the YWCIA from Honduras. I'm an advocate on the women's rights and I'm also an activist for my country. And I identify myself as a young health breed and I'm also a student that is studying right now a double degree in psychology and pedagogy. And I'm 24 years old Well, I'm a young passionate about feminism, uh, about the rights of women and girls, and I'm also part of a collective that is part of a volunteering work, and also a, plat a virtual platform and also a political agenda for women. The, for more than 79 organizations on all of Honduras, and it's an initiative promoted from Honduras that, so it was also living in a reality affronting misogyny, sexism, and also focus on what is to be an adult. And also that gives me the challenge to look for more, to look for a pop, popular and give their, their rights and their fortress and also for the women that's what usually motivates me in honduras thank you thank you very much gabriela it's really great to learn about the work that you are doing in honduras so i'm going to come to um our next question now that our speakers have introduced their work and what they're doing and what motivates them to do their work i want to learn more about how you build movements and how, how you build communities of young feminist leaders in your countries you come from palestine honduras the united states in haiti where we have seen how when young women's organizations or feminist organizations come together they can bring about lasting change how they dismantle systems of patriarchy how you confronted some of the oppressive 
systems that you had in your countries and were able to bring to the light the rights and needs of women and girls so l tell me a little bit about how young people in your countries have used their voices to build movements and bring about change let me first go to selena uh, thank you for your question i think it's uh, very critical to just talk about this uh, since young people are always the uh, ones who, are, who suffered greatly from unstable conditions, inequality, lack of opportunities, and they are under so much pressure that they don't know what to do and they have to prove themselves every single time. But let me tell you something, they, are, they never fail us to just uh, become, to come up with their own creative ways to eliminate the, the challenges that they are facing and just uh, move forward uh, towards uh, things more um, adaptable to the circumstances that they face and, and how to uh, bring up the positive side of each situation. So I think that uh, the youth in Palestine were eager to uh, understand their needs and they thought that um, building up groups or small groups and uh, staying in a, in, a, in a certain place to discuss or talk about things that they are not allowed to talk in general. So they started to come together. Um, they decide the place, they decide the time and just um, think about the challenges and the problem they face. And once they discuss these problems, they come up with solution with their own um, or surrounding um, um, methods uh, that they can implement in their um, communities. So the YWCA basically uh, identified this need and managed to work on this uh, by providing safe spaces. And creating these safe spaces helped a lot the, the youth that we work with, especially that the youth need to vent and talk about these issues and maybe brainstorm for some sort of solutions, not only uh, on the personal level, but they need to think collectively in order to make the change that they want to see in the community. So the youth always think about the community as a whole and not only about themselves. And that's very rare to see that the youth actually think broadly and collectively rather than their own sector or their own interests and um, needs. Because once their needs are met or once the community and the society's needs are met, they, they think by default their needs will be met. So yeah, that's I think it, in my personal opinion, of course. Thank you, Selena. Um, you highlighted resilience and the uh, community feeling of community and coming together to find solutions. Elisha, does this sound uh, familiar to you when you think about your work and the groups of young people that you work with? I mean, absolutely, right? I think that, that we should uh, acknowledge that, you know, more often than not, movements are formed out of pain and tragedy and frustration. Um, you know, and when we think about how young folks have com uh, have committed themselves to the various movements um, in the U.S., um, you know, we can't escape their work in the civil rights movement, um, which was also, you know, it, it, it came from just frustration, frustration with white supremacy. Um, if we are talking about, you know, just YWCA, the young women within the YWCA movement, like we can have an, an entire panel discussion on how they've contributed for many, many years, all the way back to 1910 um, on, you know, speaking up on social justice issues within the country. Um, but when we think about the resilience, like you absolutely need resilience to confront the tragedy of the reality of, of just being part of a vulnerable community in the country or the most marginalized or, or just being a woman or, or being a young woman. Like, like these things and these moments aren't celebratory. They're, they're formed from tragedy. And as a result, like resilience is required. Um, if we think about how young folks uh, approach the civil rights movement and how they stepped out, and whether we're talking about the Greensboro sit-in in 1960, where uh, black folks, uh, young black men, um, sat in at the lunch counter in Wilbur um, and demanded that the lunch counter be desegregated, and that led to 
50 cities um, doing the same. Um, and if we think about just like the Freedom Rise and, and registering folks um, and also just speaking out against all of the civil rights issues um, and being on the front line, um, it definitely takes resiliency and, and a fearlessness um, to be a part of the movement and to move the movement forward. And as such, we need to support these young, young, young people because they're bringing their all to the table. Um, they're bringing pieces of, pieces of them that they did not even know they had. Um, if we think, if we fast forward to 2013, when the Black Lives Movement started um, and Black Lives Matter um, matters ar arose from the George um, Zimmerman acquittal in the death of Trayvon Martin, um, there was a lot of pain and there still is a lot of pain because here we are in 2020 and then we're still confronted um, with police brutality on, on marginalized, on black and brown people, particularly black men and, and even black women. Um, so, you know, I do echo um, the sentiments that it requires resilience. Um, we had, it's been 150 years or more since the end of slavery, um, over 400 years um, that slavery, uh, when slavery started, and we're still hitting the streets in the millions to protest the fact that simply black lives should matter. And it doesn't mean that all lives shouldn't matter, but we have to start with the most marginalized folks. Um, and as you've seen here throughout the news, um, since the death of George Floyd, um, and as my heart um, still hurts and feels really heavy when I say her name, Breonna Taylor, um, we've protested in, in millions over in over 140 cities over the last three months. Um, just so that voices are heard and these protests are led by black lives. Uh, I mean, sorry, young, young people. So I think resilience, I think um, passion, I think fearlessness, um, I think those are all things that are required. Um, but I look forward to a day where those things are no longer required and um, young people can just enjoy their lives. Um, black folks, brown folks can just show up, be respected um, and just live the life equally as afforded to the white community. Thank you, Alicia, sharing that, for sharing that and also highlighting the intersectionality of, of race and of religion and of ethnicity um, when it comes to actually the importance of those voices being heard. It's not about uh, those who have a voice speaking for the so-called voiceless, but it's about us who have the privilege clearing up spaces so that more people can come and express their voice and express their, their, their struggles. And, and you resonate so much with the speech that I just watched this morning from last year's UN General Assembly where Greta Thunberg was speaking and she was saying, you world leaders are telling me that you get inspiration from me and from my resilience and how dare you? by putting the responsibility on me to solve all these issues, you are robbing me of my childhood and my youth. And it, young people shouldn't have to do this um, if the leaders made the right decisions and if our systems actually tackle the root causes of our problems instead of the symptoms. So in, I, if, I, I, if I could just add one thing to your point um, about that resilience and using young folks for inspiration, um, we lean on young people for so much inspiration when we're down, right? Um, they're going to inspire us, they're going to mobilize us, they're going to rally us. But what happens after the inspiration, right? What happens after that feel good moment? Um, and, and that's where I feel like the work needs to be done um, because it, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and, and we have to move on from the exhaustion. We have to move on from using black, um, young folks as inspiration and actually, um, zoom into their leadership and, and bring about systemic change. Exactly. And, and listening is often not just enough, right? You have to act on what you are listening to and, and really take those recommendations into account. Thank you. Um, Leticia, what has your experience been? Um, how have you seen uh, youth movements organize themselves in Haiti? And, and this issue that we just talked about in terms of, you know, having a voice and being listened to and then acted upon, how, can, how are young people breaking those barriers in your country? Yeah, so um, it is, we, we, we talk about um, specific uh, 
um, time where we are challenging, challenged um, around the world, whether it is the Black Lives Movement, whether it is uh, like with conflict. Haiti is a country largely affected by a variety of situations, whether it's inequality, corruption, poverty, natural disasters. Even before the start of the pandemic, we have been um, suffering so much from social political instability, numerous unrest, lockdown started way before uh, the pandemic. And all of this is greatly affecting the Asian people, especially the already marginalized communities. In our country, it is uh, very difficult for girls and women to secure their health, their education, their independence. And within some families um, living in poverty and facing difficult economic situation, girls' education is neglected. And often it's not a priority because parents have to think about um, different um, source of the income and they need the girls to to be at home um, helping uh, with, with the younger sibling, siblings so girls and women are already in a vulnerable situ um, position and they are constantly exposed to violence abuse and all sorts of injustices from their family their their family members partners their community and YWCA Haiti understands that um, in order to effectively advance gender equality and help reduce gender-based violence and meet these urgent needs of girls and women in marginalized communities, it is essential for us to invest in their basic rights. So um, since its inception, the, the foundation have been offering a variety of educational, health and empowerment services um, through two programs that we, we are um, um, continuously um, implementing. One is the Youth Center, which is a safe space for young girls starting as young as five years old to 18 years old. We started with girls eight years old, but we realized that some of our girls couldn't come to the safe space because they had younger siblings that they had to up. So we, we started accepting um, girls seven, six, and now five years old. We always laughed about the, the need to have a nursery, uh, like to, to uh, welcome babies because they are taking care of, they, they, of, of their younger siblings. At, as young as the girl's five years old, if she has younger siblings, she has to take care of them. So th this is a lot of responsibilities for our young girls. And over the years, the YWCA have been able to help more than 2,000 girls and young women um, through, through its programs. And what we, we are doing with, with the girls is not only um, give them, giving them the tools and uh, helping them acquire life skills, but also promoting their leadership. Um, with our curriculum, they are able to get um, the workshops, educating their families, their, uh, talking to, to their peers at school, at church, and being those active citizens that they, they, we know that they can be. So what we are doing is helping them identify the, the resources that they have around them and know that they have everything that they need within to develop those resources and be the change that they, they can be in their, their social, be the change that they want to see in their community. Thank you, Leticia. I think you, you raised a very important point there. It is that, um, while some young people choose to you know take up to the streets and demonstrate and and raise their voices like that organizations like yours choose also a different approach and it's not that one is better than the other it is that we need all these different approaches to be to be 
holistic to actually change educational systems, to, to change cultures, to change the way we run and communicate in our families if we are to bring sustainable change over the span of this generation. I, I, I really like what you said. Also, I think this has to be mentioned. Uh, Teresa Warren on the comment box said uh, while you were talking, none of us are equal unless all of us are equal. Kudos to that, Teresa. I think we all agree. Thank you very much for joining us. And please do keep sending us your comments and your feedback and your experiences so that we can bring them up in the course of our conversation. Let me go to Gabriela now. Gabriela, tell us a little bit more about um, the organization of youth movements in Honduras. What issues are you working on? How are young people organizing themselves and breaking barriers for youth participation? Eh, buenos días, pues well, antes de... Uh, good morning. Before starting my presentation on the field, I would like to empathize with uh, my uh, sisters and colleagues in Nicaragua because they are suffering from systematic violence right now. And uh, 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 that violence is being generated by an oppressive system which is violating the rights of young women and, and girls. I would like to uh, highlight that they are raping and uh, uh, sexually assaulting young women, colleagues, friends, uh, sisters of Nicaragua. You're not alone in your fight. From all possible spaces, we will be demanding respect to the, for the life of women. And we want uh, Nicaragua free from uh, gender violence. And now answering uh, the question which was formulated, since the 80s, it was always young people, young student people, very belligerent in at claiming their rights. And the student movement was started, starting in what was uh, known to be the, the, the cry of Cordoba. Uh, it was a, a movement which was started in one of the most conservative cities in Argentina. And our students took it up as a kind of of, uh, of a focus of how a uh, university extension, university participation could link up higher education with a society in general by building bridges with society. And through that uh, revolutionary movement, uh, our movement, the Honduran movement, started uh, an organized movement answering the problems uh, of the country. In 1925, the Federal Council uh, was chosen uh, for the Federation of uh, Honduran uh, Students uh, under the acronym FDU, and it was made up of students coming from the faculties of medicine, engineering, and, and law. Uh, currently, Honduran students have taken the, the baton of that historic memory and is now orienting, helping helping to guide social movements from different perspectives, cosmic visions uh, within the uh, characteristics of the Honduran uh, community. Uh, cultural diversity, economic uh, and social diversity of not only Honduras, but also the rest of Central American countries joins us together and acts as a as an element of cohesion towards the building of a co of a cultural uh, identity, joint cultural identity. In 2016, uh, uh, new regulations were created and uh, gave rise to a movement which has been uh, very widespread throughout the country. It has mobilized thousands of students and, and people in general. It uh, reached up to the uh, National Congress uh, in order to promote a series of reforms. And it uh, uh, brought about a series of changes which improved the visibility of young people and students and uh, a more active or more fresh representation of the people at the, at the uh, chambers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel.
that we are not for sharing not only your experience in Honduras but also your peers experience in Nicaragua and we also stand in solidarity with them so since we only have about 10 minutes more I'm going to couple my last two questions I want to ask the four of you since the uh, start of the COVID-19 pandemic and as, as I said in the beginning we saw how the pandemic exposed inequalities and even exacerbated those inequalities and pushed the poorest and the most marginalized and the most vulnerable to even difficult, even more difficult conditions. But also on the other hand, we saw sometimes how governments and oppressive regimes use COVID-19 as an excuse to really um, increase surveillance on movements and activists, to crack down on activists, uh, to stop or, or stop access to internet or communications or um, stop people from uh, coming together in movements um, and, and really uh, even further shrinking the already shrinking civic space. Um, I want to learn from you, uh, how has COVID-19 affected the social justice movements in your countries and, and the contexts you work in? And what is the most important thing that, thing that young people and these movements collectively need right now from the international community to support their efforts? Let me first go to Alicia. Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, <laughs> it was it was pretty hard um, to kind of adjust to what was happening in um, in the movement, not only nationally but also uh, globally. Uh, when I think of of the movement, I I think of human connection. Uh, um, I think of respect. I think of the inherent desire to support and lift the most vulnerable populations up. Um, and I think about the ability to create spaces where folks can retreat um, and find strength um, and, and create action plans for change. Um, and, and then when you couple that with COVID, um, I found myself personally um, at a loss um, and very, very emotional and, um, and oftentimes overwhelmed with emotion on uh, how are we going to move forward, right? Um, if you look at COVID, and as you mentioned, um, the most marginalized and the most vulnerable communities are even more disenfranchised. Um, when we think about the jobs that have been lost um, in the black and brown communities, when we think about the, the high exposure um, to COVID in the black and brown communities in the US, um, where these community members, uh, they're on the front lines. Uh, they're what we call the essential workers. Um, the healthcare providers, the sanitation workers, um, you know, they support families and particularly women that have uh, been uh, the leaders of, of the families, you know, they support families that are just one stone throw away from complete disenfranchisement. Um, so as I think about how COVID continues to impact the black and brown communities, you know, I have to recognize the inequities within the healthcare system. Um, in the United States um, on a regular day before COVID, um, these in inequities exist and they've just gotten worse. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, we as a community, as a black and brown community, um, we're seeing an increase in gender-based violence. Um, after school programs where kids found solitude are no longer available. Um, the communities where kids went to school and during school hours was the only time that they actually had a full meal. Um, that was also taken away. Uh, we became even more vulnerable um, as a black and brown community. And, you know, I, I turn the TV on pretty often and, and I hear about how great the stock market is doing, but that has nothing to do with the millions of jobs. Um, that the black and brown community continue to lose um, the millions of small businesses um, that continue to go under. So there is, you know, we essentially have widened the gap um, in the despair um, within the United States as it relates to um, how, we, how we move forward and we find equal footing um, as one. Um, you know, I, I think that now, um, now that we're about six months in or more to COVID, I think that there is a re-energizing of the movement. Um, I think that the youth-led uh, resources 
um, the youth-led innovations in a way that we can stay connected. Um, it really creates a sense of urgency for us to join forces collectively to dismantle the systemic oppression that exists globally. Um, and that for me in this moment, that is, is, is exciting again. Um, and I can see a path forward. Um, to to answer your uh, question about you know what the movement needs and what young um, people in the movement need, um, they need our support. Um, they need a space where they're acknowledged um, and they're recognized. Um, they need a seat at the table. Um, you know, I would be remiss if I made it all the way through this uh, session without recognizing, um, you know, the what who we know is the notorious. Um, RGB, um, Supreme Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and um, I am constantly reminded, um, at least in the last week, of something that she, you know, one of her most quoted lines, which was, women deserve a seat at all tables where decisions are being made. Um, for me, to answer your question, um, I would like to add that young women deserve a seat at those tables where decisions are being, are being made. If you look at uh, the boardrooms, um, for nonprofit or NGOs, the boardrooms for foundations, corporations, school systems, and even politics, um, not the boardrooms, but political officials, uh, they're, we're underrepresented, um, not only as young women, but as young people. And that is where the decisions are made that impact the lives of so many within our communities. So, you know, I, I would say that as we continue to find a way through COVID, I do believe that it is a transformational period for us. Um, I believe that we have learned new skills. Uh, we've learned to depend on each other um, in a way that we may have taken for granted or not needed um, before COVID. Uh, but we also need to make sure that um, young leaders uh, receive the professional development opportunities that they deserve, um, that they're not tokenized, that we move them from um, come over here and volunteer and inspire us but we make sure that they, we carve out an economic advancement plan for them because they too have families to take care of. So um, I am inspired um, and I look forward to, to what, uh, what the movement has to offer. Thank you very much, Alicia, for those very powerful remarks and also bringing the memory of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I think not only for the U.S., but for us as a global community and young women and girls all around the world, she has been an inspiration and may her soul rest in peace. Selena, over to you. How has COVID-19 impacted your work and the communities that you are trying to serve? Uh, well, I think we all agree that COVID-19 added up to the already existed challenges, but uh, looking at it in a bright side of it, I think it accelerated the adaptation of virtual tools and, and platform. And this is some, somehow helps, you, helps us to like um, get bigger opportunities, I guess, and uh, get more involved in the virtual world or, or maybe get uh, uh, more e-jobs and uh, be able to just uh, like, like get the skills that we need and understand more of the um, high demanded uh, skills that we should obtain in order to continue and stay resilient in this world. I also think that we are now being perceived differently, that a lot of people, a lot of us have contributed to this crisis mm. based on their expertise and we are being addressed differently. They are seeing that we have potential, that we have the skills, that we have the right um, skills to move forward with the hazardous uh, situations. And um, they are taking us more seriously. And I think that uh, COVID unleashed this um, stereotypical image of youth that we can't do anything, that we always uh, need someone to do things for us, but it's not like that. Uh, we know what we want and we can advocate for this. And uh, I can share what we uh, have done at the YWCA of Palestine, that the youth that we work with um, asked for um, um, uh, for support and we managed to provide them with 52 initiatives based on their needs and the families who were greatly affected from COVID-19, whether financially or uh, suffered from gender-based violence, especially that during these times, violent, violence have increased drastically and it, like the whole 
aspect of life changed. So uh, yeah, I think that we should look at it differently and think collectively to move forward with what the youth are made for and just give them some space in order to uh, practice their skills and be there whenever they want. Thank you, Selena. We completely agree. Let me go to Gabriela. Gabriela, how has COVID-19 impacted the work that you are doing in, in your communities? Uh, particularly, how has it affected the work that young women and girls are doing in communities, especially given uh, the high numbers of gender-based violence and others that we were talking about just before? I think uh, Gabriela is experiencing a bit of an issue with her audio. Perhaps we can... No problem. Let's go to Leticia then. Leticia, over to you. Yes. So, um, as I was saying earlier, um, Haiti was already experiencing a lot of uh, challenges um, given the, the social, political instability that we're facing. And with the COVID-19, we, we were uh, lucky enough to not um, be facing the, the lethal form of the, uh, of the pandemic. So we weren't as much affected um, by the, um, um, the effect of the pandemic, but what really affected the communities were the measures that were taken um, regarding the, the bans for um, um, not people more for more not more than 50 people to to be at the same place at once a lot of um families have seen their their source of income decrease or um have lost income um due to the the those measures and within our activities our programs we have to we had to rethink the way we um, give access to the safe space. Um, and like Elisha said, um, one of the um, main important safe space is for the girls to have a, a, a space where they can be together and feel safe and um, think about um, their challenges and find solutions. and they have not been able to do so since March and they have been um, facing um, alimentary uh, insecurities. The, 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 we are facing food, another, yet another food crisis um, where families have to um, find a way to, to um, sustain their, 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 their children and our program was um, helping in that sense that we offer a, a hot meal per day to our participants so we haven't been able to to re get them together as often as, as, as we, we were doing it before. So all this have affected um, the safe space but also we have been getting the girls to network within their community and supporting each other. So this is the silver lining. We are seeing the communities getting together and rely on each other more often because of, of, of that, because they, they are now um, secluded to the, their community. So um, we, we are seeing um, our mentors, for example, um, getting to, to, to the girls and making sure that they are okay, that they are not uh, being uh, victimized. So this, is, this, is, uh, this has been an opportunity to reinforce the, those networks within the, the communities. But what we are, um, what are the challenges are, um, they are, the challenges are more regarding the technology and the access to, to, to internet a lot of communities don't have access to, to smartphones um, and these have been um, affecting our capacity to um, reach out to the, to the participant and still do our workshops, inform them. So 
um, what the movement need right now is more tools to reach out to these communities that have been secluded. And we think that um, this is an opportunity to get the, the, the young women access to those platforms, to um, the, the internet, to all the, the tools that they need to um, get out of the, their community and communicate with the world because we haven't been able to, to, to give access to all the, the, the population um, to the technologies. But um, with COVID-19, we've seen how important it is to, to be able to do so. so. Thank you very much, Leticia, for sharing that and, and especially talking about the, uh, the digital uh, gap that we have get when it comes to accessibility and um, the digital gender divide. And in many parts of the world, we've seen how um, there is a, the access to internet or access to technology is often very gendered and young women and girls often get left behind. Uh, speaking of which, um, I think Gabriela is finding it difficult to join the conversation too. Um, I think she's having some microphone issues and technological issues. Um, Gabriela, I just want to try one more time if you're here. Sí, sí. Ah, um, there she is. Casi no escucho, pero puedo hablar. No sé si me escuchan las demás. Bien, bien, ok. Eh, bueno, ¿qué creo que ha cambiado con estos movimientos a nivel mundial debido al COVID? Pues podría decir que el hecho que el COVID-19 tuviera un impacto tan grande a nivel mundial, no solo latinoamericano, obviamente pues en Latinoamérica se ha vivido de una manera muy diferente eh, eh, en el resto de Occidente y del mundo, nos convierte a lo que es la juventud ya que somos de las poblaciones más vulnerabilizadas, no vulnerables, sino vulnerabilizadas, eh, a la vez en las que están al frente. Porque al menos aquí, en lo que es la región centroamericana, las capturas del Estado, como lo son Honduras y Nicaragua, y la colonización y el racismo vigente que imperan en el resto de lo que es la región, han vulnerado derechos que protegen necesidades básicas como acceso a salud, educación, alimentación, Y antes del COVID, más del 50% de la población económicamente activa en Honduras, pues es joven, ¿verdad? Y de, esas, de ese 50%, el 65% de esa población se encontraba desempleada. Durante estos siete meses de confinamiento, eh, donde la empresa privada vulneró derechos con despidos indebidos por parte de grandes transnacionales sin que el Estado interviniera, esta juventud a la que llaman de cristal, por ser una juventud que es sensible ante las diferentes formas de opresión y comprender las dimensiones que nacen de ellas ante esa realidad, pues como juventud hemos eh, resistido, resignificado y transformado espacios, políticas, imaginarios y normas sociales. Nos hemos eh, pues, reinventado mediante microempresas, préstamos de bancos, ni mucho capital económico, Simplemente levantarse ante robos descarados por parte de lo que es el gobierno y enfrentar de manera colectiva como ciudadanía una nueva normalidad. Ha cambiado la forma de hacer... switching interpreters because apparently there's a problem with the connection of my colleague. Uh, so I'll go on. I'll take up from now. We, we may have uh, a range of uh, instructions at the community levels with webinars, workshops and uh, programs on uh, true feminine or female empowerment and uh, we have become trained with regards to different subjects such as cyber activism, body and territory, reaction techniques and, and supporting tools for crises or before crises to uh, victims of gender violence and not, not everything uh, on an online setting but uh, the problems created by uh, our government have made us see that uh, uh, acting as citizens is, doesn't imply just voting every four years, but that we can organize ourselves to uh, request uh, uh, electoral reforms. And what is that we need uh, uh, more than anything else? 
I would invite the Honduran government, mainly our government, and the government in the Central American, in the Central American region, because uh, to give us uh, responses, we need uh, governments to really prioritize the needs. Uh, so international loans and emergency laws, which have been approved by our governments, uh, really reach out to the people and to young persons. Mm -hmm. As my my sisters were mentioning, uh, we can fully okay. assume uh, roles in management and, and seat at the decision-making tables. And also we need uh, economic resources to go on with our projects for uh, the provision of uh, resources for homeless people. And we also need uh, students' loans. So we Necesitamos un alto al adultocentrismo que impera en nuestra sociedad y que muchas veces intenta pues mantener un control sobre nuestras colectivas, organizaciones, instituciones, asociaciones, centros de acopio, etc. Y necesitamos pues finalmente que las estructuras de poder dejen de infiltrarse de manera descarada en nuestra vida orgánica como defensoras, activistas y facilitadoras para perseguirnos, criminalizarnos y finalmente pues asesinarnos. Y con esto finalizo mi ponencia. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, thank you very much, Gabby, and also to the interpreters, and I want to apologize for the mishap that we had. Gracias a Gabriela. Eh, y quería... Eh, disculparme por el problema que ha habido anteriormente con la conexión. Y con eso, y con este mensaje de tanto calado que Gabriela ha compartido con nosotros sobre la protección de las activistas jóvenes, porque a menudo eh, invocamos la participación de las jóvenes, eh, eh, a menudo a veces eh, se pierde perspectiva de los riesgos que corren al ponerse al frente de las actividades. Y muchas gracias, Gabriela, por eh, esa recopilación que ha supuesto su presencia. Muchas gracias, Selina, Leticia, Elisha, Daniela, por compartir con nosotros vuestras historias, por inspirarnos a todas. Eh, para mí ha sido un enorme honor compartir esta sesión con vosotras y eh, estaré encantada de verme otra vez con vosotras. Para todas las compañeras que nos habéis escuchado esta tarde, muchas gracias por compartir este rato con nosotras. Y si tenéis algunas preguntas, por favor, formularlas en la página de Facebook de la, de la IUCA y estaremos encantadas de responderlas. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, y, eh, como decía, estaré encantada de reunirnos de nuevo para compartir estos temas. Eh, Cassie, Sushi, Gabriela, Elina, Elisha, muchas gracias.